Uh, thank you uh, for uh, for all of you for being here this uh, this morning or evening or whatever time of the day it is for you. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, sharing my slides and giving a very brief introduction to sort of the why and the a little bit of the what of uh, federated learning and then um, lots of other talks coming along on the how to do it. So, uh, sorry. So as uh, we've seen, it's becoming really easy to create medical uh, ML algorithms today. Um, the activities like Monai are certainly pushing us all forward and helping us make this path of creating an algorithm really straightforward. But despite all of that uh, excitement and ease of creating the algorithms, it is getting, it is continuing to be quite difficult to create algorithms that are sort of generalizable, not brittle, and uh, can be used anywhere in a safe manner. Some of the challenges that we've seen in terms of creating these uh, robust and non-brittle algorithms is the fact that these algorithms often do not generalize well. Very, really very few studies have used external data sets. And one of the reasons is the challenges around sort of curating and putting together these vast data sets. And again, we hope that activities like federated learning will really sort of lower the bar and allow you to create from multi-institutional data sets without the need for data sharing, which can be challenging. Uh, distribution shifts, again, coming from the fact that different scanner types, different populations, all of them lead to potentially degradation in performance when you train the model in one place and uh, try to apply it somewhere else. These distribution shifts can take many forms. Uh, the data can, there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, that can occur in the data. So for instance, you may have uh, different prevalences of disease in different institutions. You may have different scanner types. We've seen this uh, repeatedly causing one of the ways in which the models can break is you train and test on a particular scanner type. And then when you try it on a different scanner type, the model performance can be quite, uh, quite much substantially lower. Uh, there's many different kinds of shifts to consider. There's uh, covariate shifts, label shifts, and any of these shifts can lead to a potential degradation in model performance. Again, uh, sort of highlighting why we need uh, activities like federated learning. Just talk a little bit about some very specific examples that uh, we have been working on. So I, um, so I've been doing a lot of work in both radiology and ophthalmology and oncology. In this specific case, I'm just going to touch upon some activities in the breast density arena and uh, mammograms. So the uh, breast density is, again, uh, routinely reported when mammograms are read. It's a significant risk factor for breast cancer, as women with high density are at substantially higher risk. Also, uh, women with, in cases where there's uh, high breast density, uh, the cancers may be hidden. So again, developing a breast density algorithm is really important. Uh, despite the fairly routine nature of this task, we actually find this a substantial amount of inter-rater variability. So that's something else to consider as you're thinking about uh, federated learning, is that where are your labels coming from and how uh, sort of reproducible and repeatable is the labeling process. When you have data coming from different institutions with a lot of variability in the labels, that can cause problems as you're training your models as well. So uh, this was some data from our breast density um, experiments. This was a large, we had access to a very large uh, data set of multi-institutional data set of around 33 institutions uh, with sort of three main scanner types. And we can see if you look at the histogram of the image intensities of uh, data coming from these scanners, they look really quite different. So when you train in, on one scanner and test on the same scanner, as you see on the diagonal elements, your performance is really good. But when you train on one scanner and test on a different scanner, as you see in the sort of uh, the uh, leftmost row, third column, uh, third, sorry, leftmost column, third row, you see that the performance has dropped quite substantially. So this shows us that often these models, again, you, if you train and test on the same uh, data set, you may not recognize how uh, it may perform on a new data set. And if you had access to all of the data, as you can see in the bottom row, you see that the mod model performs really quite well. So why don't we just do that? It would be wonderful if you could just put all of your data together and train a model that works on all of these different data sets. But in, in practice, that's really quite challenging. So we, because of issues around patient privacy, uh, it is really, really hard to share data uh, for institutional reasons, for patient privacy reasons, 
the resources that are required for de-identification are enormous. So if you want to make sure that you can share your data and put it into a repository, we need to make sure that it is free of PHI. And that can be very hard to do. There might be information in the uh, in the DICOM header that you need to strip. There might be all there may be information burnt into the um, the image itself. So de-identification is a very expensive process. Uh, moving data sets around can be quite ex uh, resource intensive and cumbersome. And so, although it's wonderful and there's a lot of efforts nationally, such as PCIA for uh, cancer imaging and Medric for COVID data sets actually creating these data sets uh, from across the globe can be quite challenging. Uh, again, there are in, uh, policies in different countries that allow you, that may prohibit you from putting data in, internationally. So uh, moving data again can be quite challenging. One of the interesting things we've noticed is when we train data from multi-institutional data sets, this, the networks often seem to learn the, the uh, scanner type first, and then within each scanner type, uh, learn the disease or learn the uh, attributes of, of interest. So that's something that is an active area of research is how best to make it so that we, the uh, the models are not learning the scanner types first, or at least trying to disentangle that from the uh, the person. Another disease we've been working on is babies. <laughs> really a problem in a lot of uh, low and middle income countries and is a, a leading uh, cause of preventable childhood blindness worldwide. We had a wonderful model that we created here um, using data from mostly a North American population with experts from around the globe training, helping us create the labels for that. But then we see the same set of issue when we train and test on a uh, single population, we get great results, but when you train on one population and test on another, you suddenly see that the model performance has dropped substantially. Yet another challenge that we have is this notion of inter-rater variability. So this, uh, again, when you're thinking about federated learning can be a challenge. The idea is that if you say take the same image and ask a bunch of raters to rate it, in this particular case, it is for ROP, they were on a one to three scale of disease severity. So the green is normal, the uh, yellow is an intermediate grade and the red is a severe uh, disease state. What we find is that different people actually have very different thresholds between sort of what is mild and what is moderate. Uh, as you're thinking about federated learning and as you're thinking about these data sets that have been labeled by different people from across the globe, that is something that you need to really think about is how to harmonize all kinds of things around uh, the data sets, including the labels. Uh, we see this repeatedly across many diseases that uh, people are not um, necessarily the same. Uh, they act they can label things differently, uh, and that can manifest itself in different ways. As if you plot their performance on a ROC curve, we can see some are more specific and some are more sensitive. Uh, we can also see that the disease prevalence can be quite different, as you can see between um, B and E here, these two highlighted uh, rows. Uh, the disease can be very, really common in some areas and not very common in other areas. So when you're training your models and testing your models, that's something else to keep in mind. This is some work from colleagues that again uh, commented on this issue. Uh, when you're training and testing with different labels, we have to be quite uh, aware of the potentials for discrepancy between the different labeling uh, techniques. Another challenge when we are uh, creating models is that the data is often comes from a sing sort of certain parts of the country and is or or. Uh, not necessarily from the world. <laughs> we really want a global uh, data set and we tend to not have that. We tend to have fairly um, from small uh, swaths of the countries where we get a lot of the data from. And this is really not good if you want to train diverse data sets. Uh, there's also the potential for bias. And so there's a lot of information that seems to be hidden in images like, such as test x-rays or your, uh, your fundus photographs that may have implications for bias. So for all of these reasons, we really want to be able to train models from, federa from a, a federation of sites. And there's different ways to do that. But the advantages that we hope that federated learning can solve is reduce the cost of data sharing by allowing the data to remain within institutional boundaries uh, while in a privacy preserving manner, develop more generalizable models, develop models for rare diseases. Often there are situations where there's not enough data at a single institution to train the model address this notion of variability, so develop sort of more objective measures of disease severity, 
and uh, increase the diversity of the data set. Many different ways in which people have considered um, this notion of distributed or federated learning. Uh, the sort of the most trivial is a notion of ensembling. So you train models from four institutions and then just ensemble them. Uh, the, the federated learning is what we're gonna spend most of today talking about, this uh, cyclical weight transfer, this split learning, sort of different ways in which you uh, essentially do the same thing, which is you uh, move the model weights around and do some kind of aggregation, but don't really uh, share any data. So this is uh, so this more classic federated learning and it's typically accomplished using either weight averaging or gradient averaging or many, many other flavors now. Uh, so sort of the very basic idea is you have a central parameter server, you have multiple hospitals, each of which that have their own data and some compute. The model goes down to each institution, it trains locally, uh, the model weights are uh, updated and sent to a central server where they're aggregated. If the new model is sent back down to each of these institutions again, and this process sort of uh, continues until some kind of convergence is uh, attained. At the end of it all, you might have a central global model. Uh, you could also choose to then do some more fine tuning at your local institutions so that you have a central model and many sort of fine tuned models locally. Uh, as a practical example, we did this uh, a few years ago as a real world, uh, one of the first uh, practical real world examples of this for breast density. Again, we see that the images look quite different uh, from each scanner type coming from the different institutions. The uh, histograms are different. Surprisingly, the labels are different. We expect that this distribution should take a fairly normal form in terms of classes of this four uh, breast density classes. We find that Certain institutions don't use certain labels at all, which makes uh, matters quite quite a bit more complicated. Uh, but overall, we are able to show that we get much better performance when we are when we do federated learning than just um, local fine tuning. We did a similar thing with uh, in ophthalmology with ROP again. We, again, we had these um, different institutions with different number of data sets, different prevalence of disease, a lot of heterogeneity in the data. And basically, the, each site was not able to show or uh, train a model that was good. So this was the uh, locally trained model perf performance, meaning that the, some sites were a, only had like really terrible models because they didn't have large enough data sets or they had some challenges with their labeling. Uh, if you put them all together, you got a really good model. If you did federated learning, you also got pretty good models. So uh, we were able to show in a really practical way that having access to uh, multiple data sets and federated learning allowed us to do something that a single institution would not have been able to. Uh, increasing the data set size was one of the aspects of why uh, the models were not good at certain institutions, but also we need a lot of examples of the positive cases. And because it's a very rare disease, uh, e even if the number of cases is high, if the prevalence of the disease is low, you may not see enough positive cases with model to learn. So a variety of different factors. Uh, once you have a model and you do this, you can do all kinds of interesting uh, public health type activities. You can see places where they have much higher than expected disease prevalence or lower than expected. Uh, and, and we learn all kinds of interesting things about the clinical implications of uh, the disease by doing it in a federated way. So the proportion changed uh, quite substantially. The prevalence was different. Even how people were labeling things was uh, different. And by, again, federated learning, allowed us to learn all of these differences between sort of the biology of the disease, but also human aspects such as uh, labeling of the disease. Lots of technical things to consider, whether you're doing uh, synchronous or asynchronous, uh, whether you want a final uh, central model, do you need local models? Uh, logistically, we had to come up with some, I mean, there were some phenomenal efforts that have happened, for instance, for brain tumors, where agreeing Finding a consortium of willing participants and agreeing about everything is challenging. What is the clinical problem? What is the data set? What is the architecture? How do you annotate it? What is the, how do you uh, decide what the IP and publication strategy is? What is the infrastructure? Lots and lots of practical things to be considered. Uh, in terms of the, uh, another challenge is how do we incentivize participation? What are the true risks? There's always uh, risks about um, sort of reverse engineering the weights. And uh, so what, what does a true risk versus hypothetical risk? How do we uh, evaluate data? This is something we've thought a lot about and don't really have a great answer is, should, when you're doing this sort of consortia, do we 
get people to evaluate data based on quantity, quality, how do you measure it, diversity, is it data driven? Uh, so lots of lots of different uh, research questions. And so uh, in summary, I think it'd be large multi institutional well curated data sets. Uh, there's a lot of challenges with providing. Um... So, uh, so in conclusion, I think uh, I'll hopefully have motivated why we we are so excited about the potential for federated learning, and then I will uh, hand it off to the others to show how to do it for real. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jayshree. Uh, I don't see any questions in chat. If you have any, um, I'll give it up 30 seconds or so. If I see any pop up, we can ask Jayshree. Otherwise, we'll head over to Holger. Let's see, one came in really quickly. Uh, any advice around labeling taxonomy? Are there standard groups, uh, are there standards groups can agree or rally around? For example, disease types, et cetera, or anatomical regions? Uh, I think that's a really, really good question. Uh, and I think uh, in order to be able to successfully do federated learning at scale, you really need to have that sort of semantic labels for everything. And one, Certainly for disease labeling, what we found to be useful is having consortia with, of experts sort of coming up with a rubric of exactly how to label things. Uh, on the anatomy and other sites, there are many um, uh, sort of taxonomies that people have used, whether it's uh, semantic codes from various different uh, things like ICD-9 codes, which are not very good, but also like uh, rad -like. So there's many different, uh, vocabularies and terminologies that can be used. And I think it's really important that we, before we start this project, we sort of all agree on how things are going to be labeled. E even things like age, often it's by uh, sort of by binarized or uh, binned and what the, the threshold between the various classes, like old versus young, is it 65, is it 85? Things like that can, can have to be decided ahead of time. So good question. Lots yeah. of uh, efforts around that, but ontologies can be very helpful there.